Well, good morning, Hill Country. My name's Mark Canada, and I'm brand new here. I just came on staff as the pastor of community and discipleship, and it really is. It's an honor to be with you today, and if you're a guest with us, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. It's really an honor to have you here with us today, and one of the things that I hope to be able to do over the next several weeks, if I haven't had the chance to meet you, I'd love to have that privilege and opportunity to be able to say hello, and so if you haven't come up to me yet, please come. It's helpful to be able to get to know people's names and faces, and so I can't wait to meet you, but until that happens, I want to introduce my family to you, and here they are, hopefully here really quick. I got my beautiful bride, Jackie. We've been married for the last 12 and a half years. She's the love of my life. She's changed my life. She's an incredible woman, and we've got four wonderful children. We've got Kate, who's in fourth grade right now. She's nine, going on 20. And then we've got my son, John, who's seven. We've got our daughter, Nora, who's five. And then we've got our middle linebacker, Matthew, who's three. Now, I do need to tell you this. About a year and a half ago, when we had sensed that God was leading us to move here to Austin, my wife and I got together and we're like, you know, it's time. We need to tell our kids that we're going to be moving here to Austin, and we got to let them know, and we weren't sure how that was going to go, because we were living in Pennsylvania at the time, and we'd been there for a number of years, and we're like, okay, God, you need to help us, like, know how to do this, and so we sat our kids down, and we started to talk to them, and we said, hey, guys, like, one of the things that you need to know is that mom and I, we've been praying about what God wants for our family, and we want to follow him no matter what, wherever that is, whatever that looks like, we want to follow him, and we believe that God's leading us to move to Austin, Texas. And our daughter at the time was thrilled. She was so excited. It was a new adventure, a new opportunity. She's the oldest. She was bold and uh, just amazed about the idea of it. But our son, John, he got really upset. And he wasn't so sure what he thought about moving to Austin, Texas. And the thing that was driving his mind was simply this, is in his upset nature, he looked over at uh, his mom and I and he said, but guys, do, do they even like football there? I love the fact that that was what was on the forefront of his mind. And I said, buddy, you have no idea. You have absolutely no idea. And what we've come to find out now that we've lived here for a year and a half is not only are y'all passionate about football, but y'all are passionate about some of the most amazing barbecue on the face of this planet. And some of the most amazing Tex-Mex on the face of this planet. And you guys have Blue Bell ice cream. Like, it's literally changed our lives and our pant sizes, so thank you. We genuinely appreciate it and love it. We've, we absolutely love being here in Austin, Texas, in the greater Austin area. And like I said, we've been here for about a year and a half. And you'll have to excuse me because I do get excited about football and food. And so those are two things that I get pretty passionate about. And I feel right at home here, so thank you for that. But one of the other things that I get incredibly excited about is I get so excited to be a part of a church who is passionate for reaching every man, woman, and child with the life-changing reality of Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how excited I get to be a part of a church like that. And not only that, I get excited to be a part of a church who doesn't just hear what Jesus has to say, but actually puts it into practice about what it means to make disciples who make disciples. I get so excited at the thought that we get to be a part of a family. We get to be a part of a body who doesn't just listen to it, but actually takes it seriously. And not only do you see it happen here locally, but you're a part of seeing that happen globally around the world. What an incredible heritage y'all have here at Hill Country Bible Church, Pflugerville. And I just want you to know that me and my family, all of us, we are so honored and excited to get to be a part of it. You know, for my wife and I, one of the things that we have prayed all throughout our marriage is simply this, is that God would place us locationally and vocationally at the most strategic spot for his kingdom. Because more than anything else, our lives have been radically changed from coming to know Jesus. And we want to know him even more and know him even more. And not only that, is we want to help other people know him. And we know that you guys as a family care about that. And that matters, and it really matters to us. And so thank you for your passion. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for what you care about. Now, if you're a guest here today, first, thank you for being here. Or if you've been here for the last 20 years, thank you for being here. I want to just tell you something that you may not know about yourself. 
And what you may not know is something that's true about every single one of you who is sitting here today. And it's simply this, is this is your first Sunday in the year 2020. Can you believe that? Isn't that crazy to think about? Like 2020, I don't know about you, but when I think back and thinking forward to 2020, that seems just like a crazy reality that here we are in 2020. What an amazing thing. Well, I don't know if you do this, but one of the things that my wife and I love to do at the beginning of each year is we love to just kind of sit down together and begin to plan and think through what's coming ahead in the the upcoming year. And so we take time to do that as a family. We start to set goals. We ask questions of God of like, God, what do you want this next year? Do you ever do that? I know for us, one of the things that we've learned over our years of marriage is that we can have some incredible intentions. But until we actually set a direction with those intentions, a lot of times those intentions are never actually realized or don't actually come to fruition. And so we actually have to set a direction. Now, I've got to ask you, have you seen this to be true in your life? Like, have you ever had that happen where you had like so good, you had such good intentions to accomplish something, to go after something, to do something, but you never actually set a direction? And it can kind of be kind of discouraging, right? Like you can get disappointed. And when you think about what could be or what is out there and what could be of your life and what you want to see happen, you may have some lofty ideas. But then you kind of keep coming back to those year after year after year and you realize like you've never made any movement. There hasn't been actually action towards any of those things. And I think that's true, not just for us, but it's true of everyone. It's actually a part of our condition. You know, one of the things that amazes me is that when you look at the fitness industry in America, did you know that 12% of all gym memberships happen during the month of January? 12%. And out of that 12%, after 24 weeks, the majority of those people, statistically showing the majority of those people who signed up for a gym membership in January, don't go anymore. And in fact, get this, 67%, don't miss this, 67% of all the people in our country who have gym memberships never go. That's 67%. Now, that's what I talk about when it comes to good intentions, but no direction. Now, I know that's not true of any of you. You guys go like every week and everything like that. But seriously, think about it. See, over half of the people who own and pay for a monthly gym membership never actually go. Now, one of the things that my wife and I have learned over the years is it's not only take time to set a direction, but it's also incredibly valued to pause long enough to be able to reflect on what's happened this past year. To be able to look and say, God, what have you done this past year? What are the things that you've done? What are the things that we can thank you for? What are the areas in our life where we've seen you prove yourself faithful over and over and over again? Do you ever do that? Do you ever take time to slow down long enough just to reflect for a moment and thank God for all that he's done? Now, I know there are some of you in here, when you talk about having goals and plans for 2020, you had that done back in like October. And you were thinking like so far ahead of all the things that you wanted to accomplish and achieve. You're super driven and motivated. And you've been like, yeah, it's January 5th already. I've been doing this for months. And there's some of you like, what are you talking about? There are others of you here are like, goals. Like, that's a good idea. I've never even thought about that before. And this is literally your first time thinking about it right now of like, hey, maybe I should actually do something like that. Well, regardless of where you are on that spectrum, whether you're someone who's uber planned out, you're driven, you're motivated, you have those goals, or you're someone who's like just now thinking about it, I want to invite you to do something with me today. And I want to invite you to lean in and look at a very specific area of your life. And the area of your life that we're going to look at has ripple effects in your history and all the way into your future. And the area that we're going to look at in your life is so significant and so powerful that it's so powerful that it actually has the power to overpower your thoughts and your prayers and your conversations. The area of your life that we're going to talk about today is so powerful that it has the ability to even overpower what you worship and the decisions that you make. It is so powerful that this one area of your life characterizes and determines every single thing that you do. And this area that we're going to look at, it is either going to control you in 2020 Or 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will control it. And so what I want to do today is to invite you, whether you've been a believer for a long time, or you're someone here who is still investigating what you believe about Jesus, what I want to invite you to do today is to lean in and to evaluate your desires and your cravings. Because your cravings will either control you or you will control them. Your desires, the things that internally motivate you, are either going to control you or you're going to control them. And you see, I believe that God's created us with cravings and desires, and that's a good thing. Like, that's the way that God's wired us. But sin, sin, which is anything that we think, say, or do that goes in the opposite direction of God's perfect command. Anything that we think, say, or do that goes in the opposite direction of God's perfect command. Sin has actually distorted our cravings. Sin has messed up the internal desires that every single one of us has. And this has been true ever since the beginning of time. You see, in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, Adam and Eve craved, they desired what the serpent offered over God's perfect plan. Now, I want you just to listen to this as I read from Genesis chapter 3, because here's what it says. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now look with me what it says at verse 6. It should be up on the screen. It says this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was, here it is, to be desired, to be craved, to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who who was with her and he ate. Let's pause there for a moment. Because right here, in this significant moment in history, Adam and Eve, who were created just like you and me to be in an intimate relationship with God, are offered something that is beyond, that is around the plan of God. And rather than delighting themselves in God, They crave something that is outside the will of God. And their lives and your life and my life has been forever changed. There was such a horrific ripple effect from that one decision that now every single one of us is infected and affected by that decision. And their desire to go above and around God's plan is also your desire. And it's my desire because we all struggle with sin. We all struggle with wanting something other than what God's offered. And you know what sin does every single time? Not only did it do it with Adam and Eve, but it does it with you and it does it with me. Is sin over promises and it under delivers. This happens every single time. Think about it. Here's what sin does. Sin offers short-term, temporary pleasure but it carries with it long-term disastrous consequences. It is the very nature of sin to look good, to look appealing, to be desirable for you and I to even crave after. But the moment that we give into it, just like Adam and Eve, we experience short-term pleasure. But my goodness, does it carry with it long-term disastrous consequences? And you know the consequences. You've experienced it. You live through it. It's been done to you and you've done it. And you know that it's not all that it's cracked up to be. Have you ever been there before? Come on, I want to invite you to be honest with me this morning as we move into 2020. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever desired or have you ever craved something that was not a part of God's plan? And later you felt the effects of that craving and that desire. Of course you have. One of the things I love about the Apostle Paul is his honesty 
When the Apostle Paul writes, here's a guy who used to kill Christians. And later, as he meets the resurrected Jesus, becomes a Christian. And he is willing to be completely authentic and real in his writing. And I love what he says, his honesty of what he says in Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 15. Here's what he says. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. And then down in verse 18, he says this, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire, here it is, I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I can keep on doing. Can you relate to that? Have you ever had a time in your life where you've said to yourself, why? Why do I keep doing the things that I don't want to do? And the very things that I actually want to do, the things that I know that are right, like those are the things that I can't do. And I actually find myself doing the very things that I hate. When you look back over 2019, have you ever found yourself in that place? Where you're doing the things you don't want to do, you're actually doing the things that you hate, and you just can't seem to find yourself doing the things that you actually want? When you think back over 2019, did any of your distorted cravings lead you to think things you wish you wouldn't have thought? Come on, be honest. When you think back over 2019, did any of your distorted cravings lead you to say things you wish you wouldn't have said? To buy things you wish you wouldn't have bought? To look at things you wish you wouldn't have looked at, to do things and to go to places you wish you wouldn't have gone. I know I have. I have. I've said things. I've gone places. I've bought things that I wish when I look back on it, I see that I was actually giving into a distorted craving, something that I thought was going to satisfy but really was just temporary. And I got to tell you, I hope that 2020 looks different. When I think about 2020, I don't want it to look the same as 2019. I don't want it to look at the same as when I gave in to certain cravings and desires and ambitions that had no eternal value. When I think about 2020, I want to move forward having Jesus be the one who's the all-satisfying treasure and joy of my life. And I don't know what you want, but that's what I want. And I hope maybe we can join in this together of going after Jesus because he really is the only one that provides real life. And in order for us to move forward well into 2020, in order for us to actually set a direction rather than just have good intentions, I want to invite you to look at a story with me in Genesis chapter 25. And I would invite you, if you have a copy of the scriptures, whether it's paper or digital, go ahead and open those up. Turn over to Genesis chapter 25. And as you're getting there, I want to just set up the context of this story because... I believe that as we look at this story and look at the implications of this story, it has the potential to change the trajectory of 2020 in our lives. And I don't say that lightly. I don't say it dramatically. I believe it. I believe believe that the implications of this story has the potential to change the trajectory of our lives in 2020. So in order to set up the context as we move into it, here's what's happening in the book of Genesis. In chapter 12, God makes a promise to this guy named Abraham. And in this promise, he says to him, he says that he's going to bless him, that he's going to give him land, that he's going to give him a family, which is just a crazy idea in that moment because his wife, Sarah, isn't able to get pregnant. But he says, I'm going to give you a family later to be known as Israel. I'm going to put my name on you. And not only that, I'm going to give you a child, and through that child, and through those children, and through those generations, there's going to be another child who's going to come, and this child is going to be the Savior of the world. It is going to be the Messiah. And moving on from there in that story, God fulfills that promise by giving them a child, and his name is Isaac. And Isaac marries a lady by the name of Rebecca, and they have two boys, Esau the older and Jacob the younger. And we're going to pick up in this story in Genesis chapter 25 when these two boys had grown older. And so if you have it, turn with me, Genesis 25, starting in verse 27, and here's how it goes. 
When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now let's pause there for a moment. Because right here in just these couple of verses, we get a small picture. We get a small window into what's happening here because there are some distinct differences between these two boys. Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the country, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. In tents. Now, in our culture, the culture that we live in, they would describe Esau as a man's man. He's a hunter. He's outside hunting and he's killing. And earlier, he's this hairy guy. I don't know if that, you'd like that written about you, like in your epitaph of like, he was a hairy guy. I don't know if you'd like that, but that's what is true of Esau. He's this hairy guy. And so he would have been considered this man's man. But for Jacob, in our cultural context, he would have been considered a mama's boy who loved to stay at home and inside and cook. Now, one of the things that I want to make very clear is that the differences between Esau and Jacob do not define their manliness or masculinity. These differences are merely a distinction in preferences based off of how God had designed and wired them because, please don't miss this, because true masculinity is expressed by men who are willing to live for the glory of God rather than the glory of themselves. You see, true masculinity is expressed by men who are willing to love God with all of their heart, all of their soul, all of their strength, and all of their mind, and to sacrificially love others. Are you a man like that? Do you allow this world to define what masculinity is or do you allow the word of God to define what masculinity is and are you a man after God's heart? Well, the story continues. Let's look at verse 29. It said, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I'm exhausted. Now let's pause there because I love this part of the story. And I love this part of the story because I'm a younger brother. I have an older brother who's eight and a half years older than me, and I have a sister who's 12 years older than me. Now, I need to ask you, how many of you are the youngest in your family? You're the youngest sibling. Okay, good, good. You're my people. I appreciate you. Now, really quick, how many of you are the oldest in your family? Oldest. Okay, good. Now, I want to talk to you for a second. (laughs) By the end of our time here today, you may realize how you've wronged your younger sibling, and you may need to go apologize, all right? That's coming from a youngest sibling to all, your old, to all you older siblings. That's my advice for you is you may need to apologize. Now, here's why I love this part of the story. is because if you are a younger brother or a younger sister, just a younger sibling, you know how rare it is for you to actually have the upper hand with your older sibling. Like it is one of the most rare things because they always have been able to hold it over you. They always have the upper hand. And if you're a younger sibling and you understand the rareness and uniqueness of actually having the upper hand, then you're going to appreciate the rest of what happens. Now, I need to tell you, I had an opportunity once with my brother. You see, like I said, he was eight and a half years older than me. His name was Matt. And one of the things that my brother used to do when my parents would go away is he had the unique privilege of babysitting me. And when I say babysitting, what I mean by that is he, he would attempt to see how he could either make me cry or bleed and still not get in trouble. That was success for him. And that being success for him, he thought that was character development and endurance training, which I didn't appreciate very much. But one of the things that happened in our life, even when I was in second grade, is he used to always take me to go fishing. And we used to love going fishing together. And there was this pond that was right by our house that was at this farm. And we'd walk to it from our house. And one of the things that we'd have to do in walking to this pond is we'd actually have to walk across this busy road. And so whenever we would do that, he'd hold my hand so we could go across the road. And so one day, we're going down to this pond, and he's holding my hand. We go across the road. And there's this fence because there used to be cows uh, that would come in throughout the day around this pond. And it was an electric fence. And I said to my brother as we crossed the road, I said, hey, what would happen if I touched that fence? And being the loving, gracious, kind brother that he was, he said, well, just touch it. Now, in that moment, I knew that he responded too quickly. He was all too eager to have me reach out and touch it. So I paused for a moment, and I thought to myself, you better learn here, don't touch it. 
And so I just kind of looked back, and I said, no, oh, that's all right. And so we kept walking. We went down to the pond. We went fishing. And after a little bit, we got done, and we were walking back. And I was holding his hand, and we were about ready to cross the road. And he wasn't paying attention. And I looked over at that fence, and I thought to myself, I have an opportunity right now. I can grab hold of that fence and see what it does without his influencing of it. Or I could just not do anything. But why would I do that? Because I have an opportunity. And so I reached out as fast as I could, and I grabbed hold of that fence. And I'll tell you, this electric shock, this current went flying through my body and into his body. And all of a sudden, he went, whoa, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> and it was one of those moments where I thought to myself, like, I got him. I got him. I finally got him. It was awesome. And to this day, we still talk about that moment because me as the eight and a half year old younger brother, I rarely had that moment ever in my life. And it was so good. And it was so good. Well, the point of the story that we're looking at, Jacob realizes that he has a unique opportunity with his older brother. Look at what it says in verse 31. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. And Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? And so here in this moment, Jacob, rather than being gracious to his brother who's hungry and in need, he wants to see what he can get out of this moment. He wants to see what he can get out of this deal. And what we see in Jacob is he goes massive. He goes huge in his request. Now, it's hard for us to understand what an ancient Middle Eastern birthright meant. And it, I just want you to know, it is so much bigger than a younger brother like asking to have his bro brother's favorite pair of boots or his truck even. Like it's way bigger than that. And so what I want to do is I just want to try and break this down as simply as I can understand it because there are actually three components to an ancient Middle Eastern birthright. And the first component was wealth. You see, in a Middle Eastern birthright, the oldest son in the family would receive two and sometimes up to three amounts of the inheritance from the father. And so when it came to the longevity of that oldest son being financially secure, this was a big deal because he was receiving two to three times more than anyone else. And so part of the birthright was considerable wealth. The other thing that the birthright included was power. You see, the oldest son would have authority over the entire family once the father passed away. And so whenever there was a big decision to be made among the family or something had to be decided, everyone would come to the oldest brother and he would have the authority and the power to make that decision. This is not a democracy. And the third component of the birthright was blessing. You see, if you inherited the birthright as the oldest son, there was this belief that God would be with you as the leader of the family in a different way than the rest of the siblings. And so this was a massive, massive, extraordinary, valuable thing for the oldest brother. The birthright was extraordinarily valuable. And not only that, if you were the oldest brother, just like Esau was, this was God's ordained position for you in the family. So this is a big deal. And for Esau, just to kind of flippantly say, oh, whatever, I'm about to die, he's being really flippant with what God's ordained him to be and to do. And look back again at how Esau responds. He says, I'm about to die. Of what use? Come on. What use is a birthright to me? Now, is Esau really going to die? No. Esau's being incredibly dramatic. He's allowing his temporary craving to control his perspective. A psychologist would call this anchoring or focalism, which is the tendency for people to give too much weight to one particular piece of information when making a decision. And that's exactly what Esau is doing. He is so locked in on his physical hunger that it's caused everything else to go blurry. And it's impacting his decision-making process. Now I've got to ask you, have you ever experienced this before? Have you ever had a time in your life where you saw something online, where you saw something in a store and you knew that you had to have it? You knew that you had to experience it. And if you could experience it, if you could have it, it would change your life. You would be happy if you could just have, if you could just get this one thing. 
Or maybe it wasn't something that you could buy. Maybe it was a relationship. And you thought to yourself, if I could just date this one person, if I could just marry this one person, if I could just be with this one person, then everything would be okay because they're perfect. But then what happened after you got it? After you experienced it? You know exactly what happened. The newness wore off. The excitement, the freshness, the shine. It wore off, and it did not fill you like you thought it would. It actually left you feeling empty and wanting more. And here Esau is. He's locked into this bowl of stew, and it's all that he can think about. And look at what happens in verse 33. So Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. Now, those are two of the most painful verses, I think, in Scripture. You know why? They are so painful. I don't know about you, but when I read this story, I wish I could just jump into the story. I wish I could go back to Esau and just say, stop, just, just wait a second. Just, you just need to hold on. Just wait, just wait one minute, Esau. Do you realize what you're doing? Do you understand how big of a moment this is? Do you understand what you're about ready to trade? Do you understand what you're about ready to sacrifice? You are about ready to sacrifice your future for something that is temporary and immediate. Esau, do you realize that you're going to be hungry in just four hours from now? Do you realize that what you're doing is going to have a ripple effect? It's going to have an impact on the rest of your life. Esau, would you just listen for a moment? I don't think you understand what you're about ready to do. Esau, you're acting crazy. That's what I'd like to jump in and say in this moment. Because who, come on, who in their right mind would trade their future for something as invaluable as a bowl of stew? Who would do that? And the answer is you would. And I would. If it, were, if it were the right bowl of stew. We would. Because every single one of us has distorted cravings and desires that shape our internal desires to go after things other than God. And it's no surprise. Jesus tells us that Satan the enemy is a thief who wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And he is incredibly strategic and crafty at making those desires and cravings look good. So it's no wonder that we struggle with this. Because like I said earlier, we've all been infected and affected by this. And sin, come on, you know this is true. Sin always whispers now, never later. Sinful cravings overpromise and underdeliver. Sinful desire offers short-term pleasure but carries with it long-term disastrous consequences. And at some level, we can all be like Esau. We have cravings that get blown out of proportion. We have desires that cause us to lose perspective. You know, one of the things that I'm so thankful for is my wife because she can be graciously honest with me. Over this past year, there's been a number of times where she's called me out graciously for having my phone out while we've been with the family. And as I've had my phone out, I've been looking at email and looking at social media, and, and she's told me, like, she's like, hey, like, we're around our family right now. Why are you doing that? And it's actually caused me to pause and to ask myself the question, why? Why do I have my phone out when we have this family time together? And if I were to dig deep enough and just let you to have a little window into my heart and my soul for a moment, what I found inside is that I do that because there are times in my life where I crave significance and I try and find my value and worth out of what I do and what I'm known for rather than as a son and a child of God. That's why I do. And deep down inside of me is a craving and a desire to go after something that is so temporary. 
when what's right in front of me, my, my family, this God-ordained gift, I'm sacrificing for something that doesn't last. Do you have anything like that? Is there any area of your life where you've been sacrificing God's best for something that is so temporary? Is there any area of your life where you've had a bowl of stew that you've been willing to sacrifice the future for the immediate? Do you crave love and acceptance? And rather than finding that in Jesus, you're looking for it in another person or an image on the screen that's always going to leave you feeling empty and lonely? Do you crave security? And rather than trusting in the living God who upholds the universe by the word of his power, you've sacrificed being able to bless others so that you can hoard resources for yourself rather than leveraging it for other people? Or do you crave significance? And rather than finding your significance in who Jesus says you are, you find yourself longing for that next raise, longing for that next promotion, longing to be known and noticed. And you're finding your worth and your value in what other people think. I don't know what it is for you, but I do know this, is that every single one of us is susceptible to trading God's best for the immediate. Every single one of us. So how do we control our cravings as we begin 2020? How do we do it? How do we do it? Because this matters. <laughs> this matters as we go into 2020. And I want to invite you to just consider three quick things with me. First one is this, is would you be willing to consider the future? If you were to imagine one year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, if you were to think about that future, and imagine yourself living into that future. Would you be willing to do whatever it is you're doing with that bowl of stew right now when you consider one, five, and ten years from now? Would you just take a moment and consider the future and begin to ask yourself the question with whatever that bowl of stew is, whatever that craving is, whatever that desire is that's taking you away from Jesus, would you be willing to say, God, is this the wise and God-honoring thing to do with my life right now? Would you consider the future? And as you consider the future, the reality is, is that you may become aware of some things in your life that is causing brokenness in your relationship with God. And if that's you, would you be willing to do this second thing? And would you be willing to confess your sin? Would you be willing to tell Jesus you're sorry for desiring something other than Him? Would you be willing to tell Jesus that you don't have it all together? And that you need him. And that you're tired of going after those things that will never satisfy. You see, John says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, that Jesus is faithful and just and will forgive our sins. And maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And you're still living in that brokenness. I want you to know that you can know him today. That you can be restored into a relationship with him by asking for forgiveness of your sins and believing what Jesus did for you on the cross. He is faithful and he is just to forgive you of your sin. And not only that, I want to add just this one third thing. Is would you be willing, as we move into 2020 today, would you be willing to correct your focus? You see, Paul says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Would you be willing to allow your mind to be transformed today so that you are no longer, no longer investing your life in what this world has to offer, but your eyes would be fixed and transformed by the truth of who God is and what he says about you so that you're no longer living for yourself? living for him. One of my favorite authors and pastors is a guy by the name of Paul Tripp. And here's what he has to say. He says, if you don't keep the eyes of your heart focused on the paradise that is to come, you will try to turn this poor fallen world into the paradise it will never be. So could you just dream with me for a moment? Could you just imagine something with me for a moment? 
as you think over 2020 and what it could look like, is it possible that the reason that you're here today is because God wants to set a new direction for your life? Is it possible that God wants to set a new trajectory for your life where it's a life where you're able to actually consider the future, where you're able to confess maybe sin that's there, but even beyond that, that you're able to correct your focus so that your vision is God's vision, that your plans are God's plans, that you're walking in step with him. And I just wonder, I just wonder, what could 2020 look like if Jesus was the thing that satisfied your soul? What could it look like? Well, here's what I want to do is I want to invite you to stand up with me. And as you stand, what we're going to do is we're going to sing this song. But as we sing this song, we're going to be correcting our focus on Jesus. So let's sing this out together.